However, I will say this also right now. I'm going to document this again. We're doing this constantly. So whenever you say that you found drugs in my house, he didn't. I have never used any drugs at all in my life. I've never even used marijuana, and I didn't have to worry about inhaling, okay? Okay? I'm not going to condemn everybody else for any actions or infractions as youth in the past, but let me ask you something. When I was younger, I do know for a fact marijuana cost 25 cents, 30 cents for a few few pieces here and there, a little nickel bag, as you used to call it, right, of the evil weed. Who would believe that today one ounce of marijuana would be worth thousands of dollars? Ah, that the seed is worth thousands and tens of thousands of dollars. Now think about it. The farmers right now have been targeted as part of one of the New World Order's greatest enemies. How many people know how many farmers there are left in the United States? Not very many, are there? In fact, the Department of Agriculture is finally going to reduce its numbers because some of their farmers died. You know, each one has one farmer, each employee. That's how bad it's gotten. Well, what they did is they made sure that they undermined several different aspects of our community, and farmers were important because he who controls the food controls the nation. He who controls the water controls the food. So all this is tied in. No single event or activity is separate. The helicopters are in an eradication phase to make sure that that product never comes back ever, not as a drug, but also not as a useful tool. And as long as that happens, we'll still have contentions over the forest so the eco-freaks have something to argue about. If we didn't have to worry about that, and if we still had hemp in production, we wouldn't have to worry about plastics pollution either, would we? Because hemp accounted for 80% of our rope production in the United States. And it was also an exportable commodity that we sent to other countries as rope, and as paper, and as many other things. So it all ties in better. The helicopters serve that small purpose, very small, but for the most part, they're designed to also, in their initial phases, were designed to condition us and get us used to the helicopters in the air. Probably the best, what were you saying? The best example of this, how many people have been watching, and again, I only caught it by accident, and it's because, again, I haven't been watching television. How many people have been watching new television programs and have been paying attention to the background noise that they use? Five different programs now that we've caught, because we just kind of flick on the TV, the background noises aren't the sounds of your regular city, like being in downtown Atlanta. If you were at a store, you'd hear beep, beep, map, 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 people noises. Instead, you hear the sound of helicopters in the background. Now, to challenge you on this, go to a gas station when you're pumping. If you ever do hear a helicopter, an unusual plane sound, don't look at the helicopter. We always do. We're not, you know, we're, not, we're not dead to the world yet. Look around you and see how many people are looking up to see what it is. Yeah. So did it work? You see? Conditioning. Desensitizing. So when the time comes that the helicopters are used covertly, who will be paying attention? It's a part of everyday life. Like Orwell said, they will make it part of everyday life. And it has become that. And on television especially, and I notice this because I've worked with different productions and things before with radio, etc. And it's one thing you notice when you've been in radio because you use sound, right? You ever use a piece of metal to make thunder? Right? These things stand out after a while. Their primary purpose, though, the black helicopters in the first phase, once they're implemented, and this is, there's no doubt in my mind, we've seen activities like this before. The heavy lift helicopters are very important because they're needed for prisoner transport in the initial phase of any action that takes place. First, they'll be used for assault troop transport to get personnel into an area fast. The next phase, though, is that when you've gone block to block, house to house, door to door, what do you do with the prisoners that you collect? Well, if you try to move them by ground, I guarantee I'm going to try and get them back. So they decided very quickly that the logical, the logical way to deal with this is take your prisoners, plastic cuff them up, walk them into the chopper. You've got dog points on the ground, on, on, the, on the deck of the chopper. You run steel cable through that, put a padlock on the end, and everybody's there until you get to your destination. Very cost efficient, very cheap. Hustle everybody in, stand everybody down, have them sit down with their knees up in front of them, run their arms underneath their knees if you want to, and then cuff them that way, and then run the chain through or the, or the cable through that way. They go up and they cannot be rescued, and they are inside a detention facility very quickly and secure. Most recently, by the way, as a side note to this, uh, in some of the house to house search and seizure operations, we have now a packet describing their rating of prisoners, black, gray, and white. Black priority prisoners, and it's not by race, black priority prisoners are individuals they consider to be high threat. 
individuals who have been politically active, individuals who are identified to possess firearms, individuals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those people will be held automatically and will not be interrogated on site. They will be interrogated once they get to the detention facilities. Gray targets are questionable targets who are associated with the primary targets, the black targets. Gray targets will be interrogated on site by field interrogators and will be held in holding areas, which will be pre-designated. They could be as simple as simply four men with rifles on four sides to portable caging areas made up of nothing but galvanized fence with some razor tape on the top or just razor tape itself. Just the circular barbed wire that everybody sees in the movies. It can be walked out and expanded very quickly like an accordion. The third category are, are the white category prisoners, which in other words, people that they feel they can interrogate who will cooperate with the site and hand things over. Basically, oh yeah, I want his piano. You mean there's a profit in it if I can turn this woman in? Oh, I get her piano, I get her stereo, I can get also her uh, VCR and probably her car too. That's how the booty system is set up right now. If you turn your neighbor in, you make bucks. You get a percentage of the profit. That's just like old Rome. That's just like the Middle Ages with the Knights. It's just like Europe with communist Russia and Nazi Germany. Same thing. Huh? Which? Oh, the booty prize? OK, we have packets. What we'll do is we can, get, we can give you most of the information on that. They're doing that right now. In fact, one, one number to try, 1-800-ATF-GUNS. Uh-oh, you know that one. 1-800-ATF-GUNS. By the way, I call that number every chance I can get. You never know how insecure I feel when I'm on the road. And whenever, whenever I pass a payphone, I, I call, I hear their voice, I feel, I feel safe, and I hang up. <laughs> on a regular basis. But I feel better. You don't know how much, how warm it makes me feel to know that the ATF are there spying on us 24 hours a day. If you'll recall, as an example of this, a minister just died of a heart attack about three weeks ago in, I think it was Baltimore, because what the informant does is dial up the 1-800 number. It's a booty prize number. He, he rat finks on whoever it is that he wants to call in on. They give him a code number, and he collects 23 or 26 percent of whatever they take from the person as far as profit goes. Now, this character that was just doing all these anonymous calls called in an apartment complex and apparently didn't give any address. They sent these, the assault SWAT teams in, not knowing where they were going, burst into the reverend's home, forced him to the ground, beat on him a little bit. In the process, boom, 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 he died of a heart attack. They said they were sorry and walked away. The motive was profit. This is exactly how the Russians did it with an extra crust of bread or an extra political favor, that type of thing. It's the same system they're using right now. The 1-800 uh, number is active throughout the country. We know that beyond a shadow of a doubt. The original cover story that it was only a test in the Detroit area. It is everywhere, because we've tested it across the country just to see if it's working. I'm sorry, go ahead, please. Yeah, my question was, uh, I think you brought to the one, how much time do we have? Uh, before, uh, and also, what do you think the first uh, Okay. Very quickly, something that was touched on, this will overlap with that. The markers on the signs was a question earlier here, and it's something I will touch on. Every part of the nation has, um, if you look, well, when you're traveling down your secondary roads, let's do it this way. When you're traveling home tonight, when your lights are on, I want you to look in your oncoming traffic on any of your two-lane highways and in your back roads, mostly on your back roads and state highways. If you look closely, you'll notice that there are a series of markers now in the oncoming traffic signs, which will be facing, of course, away from you. This is on the back of the signs. You'll find in some cases they're DOT signs, Department of Transportation stickers. Actually look like DOT, say DOT, have numbers and everything on them. Those may or may not be neutral. We don't know yet. But they are consistent with only certain routes. The others, which were done by re as research by people first out of Indiana, um, Linda Thompson also brought this up. Many other people have discussed this. We, of course, looked into it in our area and have found it all through the country, everywhere we've gone, that the entire nation is being marked with this sign system. They started out with simple triangles done in colors. Then they went to rectangles. We've seen circles. We've seen diamonds, what look like a diamond shape, like looking at a cut stone from the side. We've seen diamonds, as in the card-shaped diamond. We've seen hearts, like the club suits. And in addition to the club suits, usually you'll find specific numbers. In Indiana, for instance, to your north and west, not only do they have the color codes on the signs now, but they've now added numerical values, which go up next to physical objects, such as zero to one or two, roads and small secondary dirt highways. 
threes through fours or fives, personal residences. Sixes, sevens, and eights vary from small manufacturing to small farms. Higher ratings such as 10, 11, and up to 12 and 13 are factories, food depots, warehouses, that type of thing. And it varies, but the code is consistent across the country. Now these signs markers are going to be used for one thing and one thing only. You get a lot of people that are foreign troops who do not speak English. No speco English. And what they're doing is just, anybody here was in Europe, served in Europe at all? A couple of you guys might have during the, okay, 60s and into the 70s, you might have experienced it. They use this with NATO for foreign troops, especially the French and the Germans, to mark all of their highway nets in Europe. It's the exact same program they're using, but it's not in Europe, it's here now. And they've never used it here before. Now in Michigan, we're so heavily marked that virtually one end of the state to the other is being used. Now, one would question, of course, whether or not those should disappear. And of course, uh, heaven forbid that somebody take a sign and trade it with another sign, not doing any damage to the sign network, but perhaps uh, one should cut the bolts off the back of the signs, put a new bolt through with thumb screws. You never know when you want a convoy to go down a back road somewhere. And when you're done with it, you can put the signs back where they belong. And of course, they never find what went down the back road. So the signs may be a mistake also for them. You know, yes, up in the UP, it's always secondary roads again, uh, not the main highways. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can show you. In fact, we've got pictures. I think we've got some here. If not, it's also on the tapes. Okay. Didn't seem okay. What you may not have seen in the dry, in the in the better states, because this this state is one of the last of the south before they go to. And what you got to watch. I'm sorry. Thank you. She's asking. In some states, we haven't seen markers everywhere. Not all of the roads are marked, and not all of the states were started at the same time. Strangely enough, for whatever reason, in our area, Indiana was the hub. It started in Indiana and spread out like a bomb from there. In other parts of the country, it varies, and Georgia may be for this region where it started. We've run into them in Florida. We have run into them in the Dakotas. We did see them in Texas. Uh, when we were out to California, though, there's a, we have pictures of it, and also when we were on the East Coast, they're using a series of other physical signs on the signs with multiple colors or with different key code numbers. And again, we're not sure what the codes are. We haven't worked that all out yet. But these have only appeared in the last few months. They have not been there forever for, you know, for the last two or three years. They've only been there in the last few months where they've been expanding the program. And no credible explanation has been given yet that fits. Uh, in Michigan, uh, 131, uh, Highway 33, which runs the length of the state, um, any east west, all east west roads are marked. So if you get back up into the state, you'll be able to find them. Um, give me just a, huh? Well, that's an option. I would think, and I might want to find a nice matching color that looks almost like the back of the sign, just purely to do maintenance on the sign. You're not going to bother with the with the sticker, I'm sure. No, we would never do that. Of course, they do peel off nicely too. It's a little different. They don't peel off well. They break up when they're peeled off. Just a minute to ask. I got to answer this question. We started. I wanted to finish the one. Okay. First of all, uh, how do I think they'll do it? Or what, how, how soon do we think it'll happen? Okay. Everybody asks that. First of all, how much time and how will they initiate it? We are in the middle of a window of opportunity for them right now that started probably three, four weeks ago. For the last month, we have been in a, in a peak situation. The reason I say that is for what, what I described in the first session. It is not until December that they actually perceive the strength of the patriot movement across the country. They have been very, they've been very lazy, and they've actually, and I won't say lazy or sloppy, so much as they were just simply not given the tools necessary to identify what was going on. Now they perceive that we're here. By January or February, they were giving marching orders to try and accumulate more data. Since then, though, We've geometrically expanded in strength, and the other side's perception has done so at the, same, at the same speed. They now have to act very quickly, and that's why the Korean War things come up the way it has. That's why you're seeing all the public announcements. Like I said, if what you heard tonight, if you don't believe all of it, doesn't make any difference. At some point in time in the next few weeks, you're going to see most of everything else that you haven't seen yet because they are going to be very, very aggressive in trying to indoctrinate everybody that they can as quickly as they can. Like I said, they're plastic. They're not worrying about going through the motions or illusion anymore. They've got to get it done quickly. They're in a race for time. Now, as regard, well, with regard to how they will do it, 
When we left the Carolinas, we were at Virginia Beach. Before we did, watching on the news, we, there was an article that was done regionally, not nationally, about the next Waco. And the next Waco is in the North Carolinas. Well, we've been on the road for two weeks. We came back to Michigan. And when we get back, lo and behold, all across the state, which is very rare because Michigan's divided in half with regard to how they give information out, we were being told in Michigan's papers and on their news programs locally, the next Waco is in Michigan. Well, wait a minute. We just heard in the Carolinas that the next Waco is in the Carolinas. If you take and divide up regionally, and they did this intentionally because of communications and control, regionally they've been announcing this in different parts of the country. There will be more than one Waco. It will be much more aggressive than anything you've seen in the past, and that what they will do, they will try to make them terror raids. Waco was an experiment. It failed in some ways, so they fine-tuned the machine. When they do this, it'll probably be five actions simultaneously, maybe more. They will bring armor and some air mobile capability with them, in other words, air assault, air, air helicopter services, and they will bring their own media. They will not use public media for the next action. I remind you, if you got the Waco tape at home, go through the first Waco tape to the later half and take a look at the action when they're burning the houses, when they're burning the, the house and the church. You'll notice that in some shots, there's as many as three cameramen with camera equipment that are ATF filming the fire while they're burning. Which means they were filming probably a lot of neat things like little kids' hands shriveling up in the flames and other good stuff like that they needed to cover. Of course, you never saw any of the footage, but we, got, we have pictures of them taking the pictures, and it's obviously moving footage. They will film whatever they can film and decide whether they're going to pick or take whatever they use, whatever they have. If it's not successful, and if they get the snot kicked out of them, you're never going to hear about it. If it's successful, you will hear about it first regionally, and then the mutual successes will be brought together with some other cover story about a successful attempt at squashing the resistance to the new world order in the United States. Now, of course, the new states of America. And it'll be all kind of gobbledygook that goes with it. You will never, ever hear about a successful patriot military action, even if it were to take place in your own home, in your own town. Because traditionally, they will never offer good intelligence data to the other side. So if we are successful and you did beat the snot out of them, just be thankful you won and gird yourself for the next phase. Now, as far as, wait a minute, as far as where they'll go, we know that we've got Claire Prophet out west. She's got a, a fairly effective military force. She's dug in. They were pretty well prepared for this two or three years ago. They, in fact, physically pointed them out with a series of propaganda pieces that were done just to identify them. And also, Clinton himself talked about the fact that he would go after other groups of people. I will remind you of something. They never lie. There is something about their dogma. They will tell you in advance what they're going to do, and they will do it. It may take them a little longer, but it's like NAFTA, the crime bill, and everything else. It's being done. So it's not done yet, but we're not that far away from it. Now, what's bothered them is this. These meetings don't make sense. We should all be sniveling and cowering in the basement. Oh, my goodness, they're coming to get me. Oh, my, oh, take my guns. I'm not a criminal. It hasn't been happening. That's right. Well, actually, I, I, like I've said, I'll be quite honest, is that we've had them sit over some of our, our friends' houses at about 30 feet at 3 in the morning. I spread the word out, and I'll say flat out, and you're going to hear about it. If I have one come over my house at 3 in the morning and sits 20 or 30 feet over the house to the point where the window is shuttered like this, there will be a helicopter either sitting in my wheat field to the right, the orchard to the left, or in the backyard where the dogs can get it. <laughs> Period. Now, before we announced that, we used to, we, my wife had a helicopter that was out the back window so close that the strut, if you're familiar with the lower, lower landing strut, was the, as far as that panel right there. Since we've made this announcement, strangely enough, I haven't had any helicopter traffic around the house because I've got 275 round drums with their names on it right now, sitting just for that purpose. And anybody who knows about helicopters knows they are not flying tanks. That's right. They don't take flak well. In fact, they don't take bullets at all. And you can only put so many 22 caliber and 30 caliber pop rivets in a plane before the airframe's not sound, okay? It just doesn't work that way. Here, uh, go ahead. Uh, two questions. One, and relative to the black helicopters, are you familiar with the pop gun tip? Yes. And the what? The I have, they were doing maneuvers over Freeport. 
Were they specters? Were they specter fixed wing, or were they were, were they rotary wing with uh, rear mounted guns? No, uh, specter was see KC one. Yeah, those are specter. Yes, but we won't put them on here for a reason. We'll give them out private, quietly. Okay, I've got I've got some of the briefcase right now. As a matter of fact, one of the things that we will say we do know we do know for a fact that there's a problem with them scrambling the transmissions. It reduces the range of everything that's being used. So they prefer to fly in the open, but usually keep their frequencies uh, to themselves. However, Federal Communications lists the frequencies also at different times. So you just have to know where to look, and we've got a few of them on hand. There are three basic frequencies that they'll use locally in every area. They're their tactical short-range frequencies, so they are they are available. Um, okay, there. This the question was about uh, the Puff gunships, or what were presently called the Spectre systems, Spectre gunships. Originally, the Puff system started out as a DC-3 uh, C-47 package. Utilizing the 762 millimeter uh, mini guns, they were also used as as uh, door guns for many of the uh, attack helicopters in Vietnam. What they did is they mounted a brace of these guns in a fixed position and attached uh, ground radars and also laser systems, limited ones at first, to the aircraft along with optical sights, and they could actually fly into an area, circle a target, and zip it with a large amount of firepower in a short period of time, kind of like a, a bullet artillery burst, just saturating the area with firepower. The present models are C-130s. They just retired all of the original fleet of C-130s that were uh, Spectre ships, and they've received an entire new fleet of C-130s that are the latest configuration and model with, with uh, 20 mil, uh, well, as I recall, I'll double check because they may have changed the gun configuration. They had both 20 millimeter and 105 uh, howitzers on board for uh, rapid, accurate, long range fire. They've also gone to larger guns, and they may have used one of the Gao cannons, the 30 millimeter cannon, similar to the type that's on the A-10. Again, most of that is classified, but the new systems have some overt data. These weapons are limited, first of all. Yes, they are very potent, and in fact, uh, de it's demonstrated that they can engage an area the size of this target at out to several thousand, uh, several thousand feet. In fact, a couple of miles, actually, depending on the range, depending, depending on what weapon they're using. The problem is, as with uh, which is a concern of everybody, is the air threat. And unfortunately, we will hope, although I'm sure they've, ch they've chosen the crews properly, the, those particular weapon systems are under the control of New World Order pilots, almost guaranteed. The only way that probably they would be dealt with in the future if you have to deal with them as an aggressor threat against the American people would be to deal with them on the ground. I recommend that first. A plane does not fly if a pilot doesn't make it to the plane tank doesn't go anywhere if there is no crew and then it's your plane and your tank and you're going to need them too so as far as the capability of the aircraft they are very effective they were used in in the iraq war they were used first of course in vietnam they used them in the panama uh, excursion and they also used them in granada but they did have some problems in both actions with targeting and identifying friendly forces just as they did during the iraqi gulf war and so there were some friendly losses from the same weapons. Your best bet is to, ha is to hug close to your enemy if you have to engage them and those, those pieces of equipment show up. If they want to make hamburger, they'll make everybody hamburger and they've got to take everybody with them. It's not too polite when your ground pounders get taken out with everybody else. So they have a tendency to back off on that idea. Um, yes, I'll go from the front to the back. We'll just go ahead. Have you ever heard of that term, sea tank? Yes. Yep. Yep. Right on the edge of the beginning of the third phase, yes. Yeah. Okay, it's a good question. First of all, okay, the question was, do I, are we familiar with sea changes? In addition to that, with regard to, and the document is 7277, 
document drawn up by the State Department to abolish uh, the military forces of the United States in a peaceful environment, a peaceful world. Um, that ties into, by the way, first of all, if, if you get a chance and other people ask during the break, a uh, report from Iron Mountain. It is eerie to read now because the report from Iron Mountain is dated back to the 60s also, and it discusses the alternatives and the way that they would manipulate the population to keep them busy while they're doing this. And that gets into the whole concept of bread and circuses, blood sports, and all the other fun things to keep people at each other's throats while they get away with this at the strategic end. Sea changes are great changes in the political, in the political arena. Uh, what they have to do with or go back to is the whole concept of the, of the British Admiralty Law and its empowerment over all people if they were to have their way to spread it to the whole planet. That is statutory law, which is against the Constitution and against the concept of the Republic. Great sea changes um, was referred to by George Bush. Also, it was discussed and alluded to at least three times now by Bill Clinton with regard to the changes of the political spectrum and outlook and composition of our nation. It was? Oh, no. You'll hear it more and more. It's been used by different parties. Uh, with regard to that, remember that in the eyes of the British Crown, the subjects are not to be armed for they're dangerous. And what this is alluding to also publicly, this is a word spoken. What he's saying when he's talking about sea changes and the fact it was, what was the name of the paper again? Atlanta the Atlantic Constitution. It was in the, was it in the story itself? On the front page is a headline, sea change. It was regard to the crime bill. Okay, what that what, okay what that is is a message to all of the insiders to the what we call the ring knockers, and for them to know full well that everything is in high gear and to expect a major or catastrophic change across the country, if not the globe, and I wish I'd seen that. In fact, it, it, yes. They've been indoctrinated. And what it is, well, what this is is a signal. This is their signal to everybody who feels that they are part of the order, you know, the order that's coming about, the new world order, for them, for them to get into gear. The idea behind it was to put on the front page of the, this particular newspaper, in parentheses, sea changes. Now, sea changes have to do with, we, we were just, uh, well, I'll, I'll try, I'll repeat it again. SEA. Was -E SEA? Sea changes as an ocean, but what they're referring to is the political sea, the ocean of politics, the sea of politics, the, the, the machine as it exists, that there is going to be, what that is is a catchword and a symbolic, it's a message to the insiders, not all of them insiders, many of them are what Orwell called outer party members, to let the outer party members know that the machine is now in high gear and is in motion now, that it is going now, that it's not down the road, it's now. So that's, that's, can we get a copy of that also? Is it possible? If you would, please, anybody who can, we'll take your address, or if you'll give you our address, if you could send us a copy of it, we'd greatly appreciate it. So this is the problem with regional media, first of all. With regional information, they can compartmentalize whatever they're targeting for particular groups, and we might never see it. It happens in your part of the country, but it doesn't happen with us. Whereas California might see it, we're fairly well armed, and we have a lot of educated individuals it would be dangerous for them to put something like that in our nose because we'd use it and be, we'd be armed with a better weapon. We'd be armed with an excellent tool. Um, well, okay, you were late. He was patient. Go ahead. Yes. Okay, we have several reports. The question was about urban warfare training facilities throughout the United States. What activities are taking place that are new? Or what's...
Right. What? Well, that's the new technique that they're training everybody in. Thank you. The other, the point is that the individual, this gentleman knows when he was taking the class, they were told to go in and annihilate everything. There are no friendlies, even if there are hostages. Shoot and kill everything. Now, there are several examples of this forced entry class, which is being given all over the country by military personnel to law enforcement, to civilian enforcement personnel of all categories, all secret police formations, and many of the new MJTF elements. It is forced, high-speed, fast entry, shoot everything, identify if you have any wounded, come in, finish off the wounded, identify and, and capture documents, document who it is that you've killed, and leave. Don't even worry about filing reports. There will be no such thing. Now, there's somebody here that will be familiar with this activity. Mac V. Sog, during the Vietnam War operation, the Phoenix program, operated identically to this. I will remind you, as an example, that Sog, S-O-G, was the code name, or is the, is the name used for the Federal Marshal Fast Attack Units that attacked Randy Weaver in Idaho. It is not accidental that they use the term SOG. MACV SOG, Military Assistance Command, Vietnam, Special Operations Groups, participating with Phoenix, went into hamlets, villages, identified perpetrators and aggressors, and would interrogate individuals, and if need be, kill them, and identify them, photograph them, or take uh, specific body parts to identify. This particular program is identical, but they're not doing it to somebody else, people. They're planning on doing it to us. Who is the perceived threat? The American people again. Now, this type of training is going on all over the country in at least five sites that we know of. And it is being performed also at Fort Polk. They're training them also at two sites, in Miss one site in Mississippi, one site in Alabama. From good first-hand sources, we have this. There is a new site that actually is in Michigan that originally was being run by Smith & Wesson that is now being run by the federal government to train in the same, in the same area. I will remind you of something. A month and a half ago, Lloyd Benson went on national television and told you all that there are 10 target counties where they will take forced house-to-house -house search and seizure to, period. He announced it publicly. He told you all in the national press, and everybody ignored it. Janet Reno said they were going to take these programs that have been so successful that they did just in the housing projects and now take them to the rest of the country. Well, what does that mean other than the fact they're going to come to your home and eat your lunch if they have their way? They figure the American people will cow down fast enough. I will make a point before I answer another question here. They, some people ask me real quick about this. Well, what about all the weapons they let us have? Well, let me point out something. They hoped that more of the, more of the criminal element would be rearmed. They hoped that they would give us just enough to get us killed. What they made the mistake in doing is letting the floodgates open, and we have enough actually to win. And that's what's bothering them now. That's why they have to turn right around and go back after this. It's becoming a real problem for them because the American people don't need much, but what little we have, we sure as hell know how to use. You give me enough weapons and equipment, actually you give me nothing more than a knife, and I will have a rifle in a period of time. Once I have that rifle, I will have an aircraft. I will have a tank. If I were them, I'd be scared about just going to the bathroom nowadays. Be quite honest. Yes. Yeah, the Bobbitt Center. <laughs> yes, please. Um, Thank you. Good. Okay, first of all, the question about the 10 counties, I know Wayne County is, and that's the best I can do. I think Orange County, uh, L.A. County itself, Dade is also counted, but I can't list them all, rattle them all offhand. Benson li listed them publicly and on a live broadcast when he did it. We've got the listing at home, but I, or I might even have my briefcase under here. I'd have to look. California. Yeah, California. Two counties in California were both, were both going to be hit. Now, with regard to how would we know what the staging areas are, or where their, their detention areas are, their temporary ones? No, I'm talking about in any given community. Uh, right. They're going to have an area where they understand they're going to get together, and it's going to be a place for the helicopter. Rally points, yes. Yeah, that's okay, well, what the question is, where would they, where, how would we identify rally points? The last three actions that took place that were MJTF actions took place 
utilizing either state parkland or uh, federal property that was adjacent to the communities that they were going to attack. When they were in Louisiana, they used an old Confederate uh, uh, prisoner of war camp that was used to house Union prisoners. The area was about 15 acres in, in size. It was not developed well, but it, was, has, it had open fields and it had areas that could be used for LZs. They advanced into the area 48 hours prior to the activity taking place. They staged their troops, their equipment, and everything within that area, and then they deployed against a 15-block area in uh, Amit, A-M-I-T-E, in Amit, uh, Louisiana itself. This was one of three actions that took place within a 48-hour period in three different parts of the country. There was supposed to be a fourth one. I do not have the data on it, but it was supposed to have taken place, and it was a lesser action in the Oregon, Washington state area. But four actions, points of the compass, simultaneously, house to house search and seizure, no knock search warrants, confiscation of all guns. In the Amit situation, they confiscated uh, 130 firearms, they confiscated five little crack vials of cocaine in a 15 block area, $350 in cash, and 25 or 30 little paper ba uh, baggy bags of mar loose leaf marijuana. Now, God knows how much it cost to pull this thing off, but what they were really after, if you take a look at the math, 130 firearms were confiscated and not returned. That was their primary issue. The rest was a, fa was a fallacy otherwise. Now, as far as what to look for, first of all, you should be very familiar with the sign markers we've been talking about. Use your eyes. You will see a dramatic and very quick change in the markers. They will add several different identifiers. Uh, we found that if they are going to do this, as they did in Europe, you'll have a team that goes around and pops the stickers on so they can identify the, the staging area very quickly, go in and go out. And it'll also probably be marked from the staging area to the attack sites, whatever they are. Rally points will have to be clear areas because of the air mobile capability that they want to have. So in other words, to support helicopters. Now, typically they've used military facilities such as Army aviation sites. Example, probably all of you have a small airport in your community right now. I guarantee that 50% of them are not owned by your city and they're not owned by the county. They were old Army aviation bases during World War II and your township or your county rents them out at a dollar a year. What that does is create a strategic reserve air base for the military and you maintain it, not them. You could go to the city, usually they'll let you know because they don't, people don't think twice about it. Uh, in many cases you'll find if you can get the budget, if they won't talk to you right away, get the approved budget for your township, your city, or your county, and if you look at the itemized listings of expenditures, you will find that they have to itemize that one dollar as part of the approved funds that have to be authorized by the county in taxes to pay to the state or to the, to the, to the Fed to use the airport. And typically it's, a do, it's, a, it's just a token fee. It's just a dollar a year. It was an economical way for the city to get an airport and for the government to maintain the airstrips. And that's the most common that they're using as holding areas for their own aviation aircraft, you know, the heli helicopters. Real quick. You got a follow-up? Oh. Well, first of all, the best one should be at arm's reach. The question is, where should we store our arms? I'm sorry. The first one should be at arm's reach. If you have a lot of them, then I put a couple in different parts of the house, and then the first one at arm's reach, and then the rest... Uh, actually, the way we do it is this. Your combat arms, my, the, the rule, if you're worried about having to leave some outside or you don't want them all in one place to be taken, you should have your personal combat arms directly available. You should have 10% over that if you have excess weapons, 10% over on site. Somebody may come to your house bare butt naked to the wind who barely got away from something and may need a weapon. Better to have as many bullets going down range from any, as many barrels as possible. Beyond that 10% at your discretion, I would pre-deploy in a friendly area, in other words, agri uh, another part of, this, of, the, of the community or, or better still in an outlying area, an agricultural area with a farming community or whatever, farmer, friend, relatives that you know, or property that you've purchased. It could be buried, that's an option. And people said, well, they could find it with spectrograph readings, you know, with infrared. Yes, they could if they knew where to look, first of all. And this is a big country, people. You're talking 50 states, most of them bigger than most countries are that are in the United Nations. They have to know, first of all, where to look. I would recommend that there are many old farmyards across the nation that are so strewn with debris that you don't even know about that to bury one more thing in the backyard isn't going to make any difference at all. 
you got old axles, cats, dogs, the proverbial mailman, a couple of milkmen, maybe the uh, grandma and grandpa buried back there, you don't even know it. Uh, you might have uh, another structure that's buried back there that's uh, full of pot iron and junk. Usually if it was an old farmstead, people walked out back and used an old gully for debris. So you've got tin, steel, and iron laying back there. All of that's going to give off all kinds of false readings. The most important thing that you can do with securing anything that you bury is this. When you dig the hole, what you have to do is line the area with plastic. First, save the topsoil down to its to maximum depth. If you can, skull that off as a piece of sod. Take the sod and pull it away from the side. Reline the, the hole again and take the subsoil and put it around the edge on the plastic and then haul it away. What is important, well, the reason this is important is because all of the infrared surveys that are done are based on changes in radiation. The fact, excuse me, that his body radiates a different temperature than mine does and yours and, his, and hers and his. Earth and material products do the same thing. Well, if you fill a hole in the way everybody usually does, you don't care what dirt gets in there first, you just want the hole filled. Well, what do you think that looks like when you look at that with a, with a, with a spectrometer? You've got green, 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 red, red, red for inorganic dirt because it's stuff that was from the subsoil on the surface. Well, that's a flag marker for me. Here, shoot here, shoot here, shoot here. So what you want to do is pull the subsoil away, disperse it, or bury it, or put it under rock. There's a lot of different options you have depending on where you are. And then reestablish the sod and secure the area and walk away. Now, a couple of options that are kind of interesting, although you've got to watch it, they might be patrolling power lines. High tension lines and power lines are easy to survey. You run one wire from one to another, and then another to another, and you have X marks a spot. And the electromagnetic field that is being generated by the power lines will do more enough to disrupt everything else that's trying to survey the area. It creates false readings galore. And of course, it's almost always metal products that are in the area, plus old, old insulators and other things are dropped on the ground. A metal roof would help, but remember that they can actually layer, although I don't think the technology is as exciting as Hollywood would have you believe because they don't have enough to go around. Remember, they only have so many units. So what you've got to deal with is a handful of elements who have to survey so many thousands of square miles each. Thousands and thousands. First, they have to suspect. And so, of course, you try not to create a red flag in that particular area. Second. Even if they do suspect, there are ways you can camouflage and screen. Sheet metal will offer some protection. The material that is used, everybody here has done microwave popcorn, haven't they? OK. In the bottom of the microwave popcorn bag, the material that reflects the radiation is the same material that will reflect the radiation survey equipment that they're using. It is available in sheet form. I, I don't have the name with me. There are several different names for it because it's made by different companies. That is a very good protection device. Somebody complained about, when I mentioned this the other day, about using blankets, for instance, thermal blankets, that, oh my goodness, it would create a signature. Well, you don't just put them in one place. You layer the blankets at different depths, for instance, from the ceilings, etc., so that they get a clouded reading or an indefinite reading. It disrupts the transmission of radiation from your site. You create variations in the field. Now, still your best bet is to bury, but if you do bury, you've got to make sure it's properly stored. Absolutely, it should be double sealed, double stored. Don't rely on one system. If you're going to wrap it, also remember, ammunition will be easily compromised by moisture. Ammunition is already a problem, as everybody knows. In fact, if you've tried to go out and buy ammunition, yes, you can buy it. If you can get it, it's about 600 or 400 or $300 a case. The problem now is getting ammunition. And that's become a real problem in general because, trust me, we have gone through billions of rounds. That by itself opened their eyes. They planned on giving us just enough to get us killed. I'm telling you that you cannot count the number of rounds. And instead of them being in a warehouse somewhere where they could go to one place and grab them, they're spread all over the continent now, all across the country. Want to try and find all those? They will the hard way. Oh, we're going to work our way across here and then back over. I'll be patient. Well, yes. Yep. National Police Force. Yes. Thank you. That's a good point. Um, okay, the first question was about Russia joining NATO. 
Second was about the 100,000 man national police force. Remember, that's phase one, and he wants 300,000 national police personnel overall introduced. Two ways they're going to do it. One is they're financing a limited amount of a limited amount of personnel. Two, uh, through local procurement. You know, in other words, we'll hire people, but they have to follow federal guidelines and criteria for hiring. The second phase is that they have already got the bodies in uniform, guys. The MJTF already exists. It is, while this is an after the fact way of financing it and calling it something else, Bill Clinton didn't, didn't create the MJTF or the National Police Force. George Bush did. What, what Clinton is doing is bringing public that which George Bush created privately and covertly, and he's bringing it all into the, into the open. The only kinds of countries that have national police forces like that are communist China and Russia. Russia's standard uh, uh, law enforcement agency is called the militia, and they're the only ones who are armed. The general population goes to their little st triple locked fortresses and pulls guns out to use on a limited range and then hands them back to the government. Now, with regard to um, Russia getting into NATO, what they're doing as much as anything else is trying to soften the blow by offering, you know, they're throwing things to the wind, first of all. We'll see how this sits with the people. Example, Hillary Clinton running for president. Everybody heard it? They actually did it at the White House. That was real. That was, that was a real statement. But what that was is to test and see how far gone we are. Well, uh, yes, that's, in more ways than one, that means many things. Yeah. The, uh, with regard to Russia and NATO, the, part of the 7277 document we were talking about earlier, and you can get a copy of it from the New American in a magazine, a magazine they published, I think it was three or four months ago at least, has a blue-helmeted U.S. soldier on the cover with a U.N. helmet. Inside, they have a copy of that document because the State Department refuses to give you a copy of their own document now. Why? Because it spells out exactly what we're experiencing right now. Russia is, has always been, and I will make sure I get this right so nobody makes any mistakes, Russia has always been in charge of all UN military activities, period. A Russian military commander has always commanded all UN activities, period. Yep, it's going all the way back. An interesting point. When the first founder or the first officer of, um, of the UN, of UN forces and UN operations, left his post, his next position was to go to Korea and be put in charge of all North Korean defense forces just before the outbreak of hostilities for the first Korean War. He knew everything there was to know about NATO and the United Nations and all of those activities, and then he turned right around, and he was now in charge of the friendly opposition. And that's why MacArthur did what he did as a twist, to give you an idea. MacArthur was vilified because MacArthur knew what the picture was, and when he did the Inchon landing, he did not tell his Russian counterpart in the United Nations what he was doing. And that's why the Inchon landing was successful because it was the first and only action where we did not tell the UN, because remember that was a UN peacekeeping action, he did not tell them that he was doing what he was doing and he won. Every other time, there has always been alluded to in a lot of movies, boy, it seems like the enemy always knows what we're doing before we do. Well, that's true because all these UN operations, we tell them before we do it. And they pass it right on down the line to the other side so they know what we're up to. Gorbachev is, yes, the okay, question was, is that why Gorbachev's here? Gorbachev is in the United States. He has an office in the Presidio, U.S. Naval, that was the U, old U.S. Naval Intelligence Headquarters, Pacific Operations, what a slap in the face. He has an office in the Naval Academy now. He has the Gorbachev Foundation in the United States, and you'll notice whenever they do articles on him, they're real fluffy articles with no specifics on where he is. Time Magazine just did something, and it was real nebulous, other than his warm, fuzzy feelings. Don't you feel good about Gorbachev? Well, in reality, is, as we know, he was a butcher. He has always been a butcher. He will always be a butcher. He was involved with the KGB. This is a man who, if you'll recall, before you could become the man who told people to pull triggers, you were pulling triggers. He was around when Stalin was around. He moved up through the ranks. This is a man that our State Department now embraces. This is a man that the Clinton administration now embraces. Think about that. KGB, same old business, same old job. Uh, okay, back in the back. Can you explain any relation to uh, reduction of population? Yes. Absolutely. I would say the question, let me, let me get right into that, because the question is, do you see AIDS playing in as a, as a, uh, 
a way to decimate the population used to destroy ele population elements? Absolutely. In fact, one of the questions we've had, uh, for, a couple of our friends are in immu immunobiology. We discussed this a year and a half ago. The greatest fear inside the medical field that they're not talking about is that AIDS will mutate. AIDS could mutate to a variety of other family and strains of viruses that are very, very dangerous. It has been the greatest fear of scientists for years, and Lorraine Day talked about this. But in their own circles, and I'm talking to people who are actually doing the research right now, because they only live a few miles from me, um, what they're saying right now, their greatest fear is that they will come up with a, an airborne cancer that could easily be mutated with the AIDS virus. Now, everybody's heard about... Yes, thank you. This strep, we just had a, in fact, I work. Give you an idea, guys. I'm only a block, I'm not even a block. I look right across out, out of the uh, back of my building to where that man just died. The one that was in Detroit. Actually, it was in Ann Arbor. This particular case, by the way, they've already, uh, there were two contradicting stories. One is that it wasn't transmittable. Well, I'll tell, I'll tell you something that they didn't want to broadcast too heavily. Three of the people who were working on him contracted the uh, virus the same day. And they're presently fighting to try and keep them alive, and they're not talking about that. And that's less than 300 yards from where I work every day. So it is happening. It is an interesting threat. The, uh, the AIDS virus itself, but what they're saying in, in Africa alone, has killed or will kill 55 million people. It's killing the middle bracket of the population, which means the very young are starving out, the very old won't have anything to eat either. It will, it will easily and effectively decimate whole population groups within a very short period of time. It seems to me that either, number one, they're concealing the numbers now, which I think is very obvious, because you know, you're right here where the people do the concealing. Remember, you've got disease control not far away, Center for Disease Control. Um, and also that they, they may have also compartmentalized it to a limited extent because they didn't want to use the card too quickly. Remember, they need to regulate how they're going to use this panic in different ways. And would it play into using the detention camps? Yes, it could also be used as a way to play into using the detention camps we were discussing earlier for quarantining, which hasn't been used in a long time. Yes. You've got to be away from everything and everybody, even people you love. Yep, isolation, which is the whole concept, yes. It fits in line with the program, too, that they used in the past. Thank You've you. already done one. I'm going to be fair. Way back in the back. Yes, there's an interesting, this is an interesting point. The secession of states from the Union, or the threat to do so, is taking place at a very high, uh, very fast pace. It is taking place because of a series of other actions that have not been heard about by most of you. Fortunately, we met with a, uh, the, a couple of patriot lawyers that are in, uh, uh, were in New Orleans who have taken the case up for Nevada. All of the county commissioners of each of the counties of Nevada have filed a common lawsuit for the state against the Fed and against the Park Services and the federal government to take back the state land that the Fed has taken from them. And they are going to kick the Fed out. <laughs> now, well, another point here, as a matter of fact, a very stupid thing that the people who were the controllers on the federal end did, they sent a threatening letter. They didn't call up and say, gee, we're going to do this to you. They were stupid enough to actually send an official letterhead, a threatening letter, through the Federal Postal Service, and that's part of what they're going into the court with. You know, it's called LOH, Loose Operator Headspace, when brain, brain cavity case exceeds brain capacity. You know what I mean? Yes? Thank you. First phase right now, uh, we've always caught it in advance before it hit a square between the eyes, and we still have a little time. I highly recommend that you go for volumes of inexpensive foodstuffs. We have already seen over the last two weeks a big primer that we're going to have food shortages. They're already talking about the future food shortages. They've also hinted through the Department of Agriculture. Remember, we've had managed food production for quite a few years now, guys. That's why we're going to starve. It's not accidental. It's intentional. We've had planned agriculture for years, just like communist Russia. That's why the farmers are down to the numbers that they're at. 
Well, they're already hinting at that because of the terrible rain floods we had last year, of course, in the Mississippi, that this is now going to catch up with us. Well, just like the ammunition, which everybody didn't listen, not everybody listened, but a lot of people did, when it was only $60 a case and it's now worth $400 a case, a bag of rice that only costs you $3 for a 50-pound or 25-pound bag right now, depending on what volume you buy, will be worth a hell of a lot less within a short period of time. If you buy it for $5 now and it costs $10, $12, and $15 next week or the week after, you have not lost a penny. You have fed your family for three times the capability of all the people who don't do anything. Now, I'd say that's an awfully cheap insurance policy. Think about it. And again, it's, it's foolish not to. Now, okay, wait a minute. There's another part of that question. Okay, I know that's not what you want to hear. <laughs> okay, strategy and tactics. What are we doing? How are we so successful? Why it is the New World Order hates us with a passion? Because we ignore the general media, and you should too. Unless it's a friendly radio station or a friendly TV program, we shut the TVs off. I talk to people. I talk to everybody I can get my hands on. I talk to anybody I can get my hands on, as long as rigor mortis hasn't set in. And sometimes I probably don't catch on that rigor mortis has set in. I don't know. That's right. <laughs> well, OK. Rush Limbaugh won't talk about a lot of what we're talking about right now. But, but what we've done is this. The strategy that we've recommended that people use is like a battle board. Take a map of your county. Take a highlighter and mark out your townships. Now, take another highlighter in a different color and circle the large metropolitan areas and give them about a mile or two mile leeway all the way around. Now, color those in deep and ignore them. And when I say big cities, I mean like Atlanta proper here and any towns that are outlying suburbs, do not go near them. Now, take a look on the map at every four corner burg that has a barber shop, a gas station, a party store and a video store, or whatever the combination is, okay? And they all have a barber shop, I guarantee you. If it's like, if it's Spitzburg, Dexter, Chelsea, you know, Monixburg, whatever it is, it'll have a barber shop. Take the tapes and make copies. Four copies of four different tapes. Go to the barber shop, give them one tape. Go to the grocery store, give them another tape. Go to the four different locations and give them four different tapes. Everybody goes to the barber shop, trust me. So when they go to the barber shop, the guy's going, hey, Frank, I got this tape in there. The guy walked in and gave me this tape. It's really weird. Have you ever seen this? Oh, I got a tape, and it's like, hey, wait a minute. That's not like my tape. All of a sudden, you're going to have intercommunications. Two, somebody's going to go, well, I saw that tape, but I didn't see your tape. I'll tell you what, you want to trade? All of a sudden, you've got interaction, and the next step is people start to talk. Now, we don't care about the eight out of ten that don't listen. The idea is the two that do are your allies. What you do is concentrate on outlying areas. Don't concentrate on areas that are already controlled. Take what the enemy considers to be worthless. Now, if you take a look at a map and you take a township and do this systematically, and again, most none of you are made out of money. If you are, step up here right now. Say, so you're not made out of money. So since you only have a limited amount of resource, $5 or $6 for blank tapes. Ooh, big whoopee. Take that $6, which you spend at McDonald's in a heartbeat and don't think twice about, and instead, invest it in your future. Walk over, make the tapes, walk out to a place, make a bunch of photocopies of what you consider to be worthwhile multimedia documents, hand out one of those to them and give them a tape, give out the tape, give out the tape. Don't talk, just walk in, smile, say, hey, you'd like to see this, or drop it off anonymously. Walk away. Go to another township and do the same thing, or another, another part of the township and do the same thing until you've saturated all of your target areas in that township. What you've done is created a bed network. You're not going to get everybody to listen, but a lot of people will see things they've never seen before. And now you have a whole population group that has been... Which would fall in line with their activities in the past, too. Oh, they did? Yeah. Oh, here, wait. He's still changing the tape. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Okay, you were going to, he put his question, okay. Yes, I'd like to know uh, what you know about the new money, uh, what, the, what the exchange rate's going to be, what can we do to avoid it? Okay, first of all, thank you. This, this is going to get into something everybody's close to their wallet and hearts, wherever their wallet is, okay? The new world order money, or the new money. First of all, if you want to find out where the authority for changing the money came from, we'll go right back to a document we've mentioned to people time and again. It's the PL 100-690 law, public law 100-690. Do not pay for it. They're to give it to you for free. 
If they try to tell you they have to charge, you tell them that it's your right under freedom under the Freedom of Information Act to have a copy of that because the government, if they come after you, argue, will argue that freedom or that, that, that ignorance is no excuse. And so you as a good citizen want to make sure you're not violating any laws and you want to see this law. Now all through it, there are a lot of different points, but the one in particular had to do with the initiating the surveys to change the money and it authorized the withdrawal of the $100 bills. It Was that just last month? No, this was generated in 1989. All of this has been done in advance. We've been telling people for a long time about this. You just heard that the $100 bills aren't safe, are they? Oh, those $100 bills are not safe. Oh, the Iraqis have been counterfeiting them, and so have the Syrians. Let me tell you a little story. Back when I was an intelligence analyst, and we predicted in advance, by the way, the taking of the embassy in Iraq, it was very fascinating, some of the things that we did know. The CIA has, a, of course, a base of operations in every embassy that we have in the world, and they, of course, have operatives that work out of each one. Well, Iraq and Iran and Syria and, of course, any place in the Middle East is no exception, except that our, our uh, embassies are built like brick shit houses, and you could knock them down with an H-bomb if you wanted to. Well, in the basement, or basically the equivalent to the basement of our particular embassy uh, in, in Iran, the Central Intelligence Agency had a money machine. And it's not like a magic money machine, it was a real treasury press. They also had treasury plates and large quantities of real treasury paper money sitting there. Whenever they paid an informant, they would crank out with their whiz machine a few hundred or a few thousand dollars of real American currency, because it's not real currency anyway, it's Federal Reserve notes. See the problem with paper money? You can fake it anywhere. Well, what they did is they crank it out, and that remember they even mentioned the little flaw that you can tell the difference between their evil currency and ours? That little flaw was put there by the Treasury so they could identify the flow of the currency as it was used throughout the world by the informants who may be part of terrorist organizations. It's real money, it's made on our paper, and it was made with our plates. They're not counterfeiting anything. They're just doing what our own government does and making lots of counterfeit money, okay? Because it isn't real money anyway. But when they came about with this, we kind of waited for this story, and they, they've generated all these cover stories for different reasons, uh, reasons, of course, hoping that we won't necessarily catch on. This was common knowledge amongst almost everybody in the intelligence field back when the embassy fell, because everybody was worried about this. It is probable that the poor guy who didn't, who wasn't let go, if you'll recall, when the Ayatollah took the embassy, all of the individuals who were black were released except for one. The reason the one guy wasn't released is the others, it was designed to try and split the population, okay, to create a wedge between the, pop the people here. The one guy that wasn't let go was down a corridor behind three blast doors, busy using a shredder. <laughs> more paper, all the while they were taking the embassy and for two days afterwards, they didn't know he was in there. They thought it was a closet. They burned down the first door and found it went to a room. Burned down the second door, found it went to a room. They used a torch. Well, when they got to the third room, they found where this guy was, busy trying to destroy everything he could. Well, he didn't destroy the money machine, obviously, and quite a bit of the other equipment, but he did a good job. They were a tad pissed, so they didn't let him go. So that little bit of history you don't know about. He did a real fine job of doing his job. In the process, though, I keep dropping this. I'm going to have to use this in a minute. He, uh, in the process, they did, of course, touch on the fact that there could be some very sensitive things that the Ayatollah got hold of that we didn't want him to have. Probably the most sensitive was that old money machine sitting there where it was. And now, of course, it's come to light. It's more than a decade later, and obviously it's being put to good use by the, Ara the Iranians and the Syrians. They're paying for the national debt with our national debt. <sighs> Wonders never cease to amaze me. They're not, you know, the daddy didn't train no fools over there either, obviously. Yes. Okay. Number one, before we get started here, there's one thing I do want to I want to point out. Okay, but and Linda Thompson, I've been in, we've been in communications with her at different times. We have a variety of different patriot elements all through the country. There have been some disagreements on activities, and there's a disagreement here on this particular one. I do not recommend that we do it the way it's been being being uh, promoted simply because we become a target of opportunity under a, under an unfriendly territory, away from our power bases. But the proposal is that we go in August 1st, I believe, and then, of course, September we go back armed because they won't listen to us in August. The date that was chosen is a Monday. Uh, the House and the Senate would not be in session the day that we show up to begin with. 
Number two, uh, as with the original revolution, when it took place, and this is not a revolution, we are protecting and defending the Constitution, we're not going to have to revolt, we already have our documents that are sacred. But as with the original revolution, there was a need to, first of all, format some form of, there has to be hostility in motion to make this declaration the way that it's been made. And it's out of sync for the other activities that are taking place. Now I've seen and listened to a portion of the literature that Linda's used that is the basis for what she's doing. It is sound provided the other side were listening. But the other side isn't going to listen. You're not going to have your day in court with regard to this. And if it were there, that day in court is the court is controlled by the other side, period. They own the courts. You are not going to get a favorable disposition in, the, uh, in your favor to try and eliminate or, or, or cease hostilities before they get started. So what's going to happen is this would create a catastrophic event in which if we we're not careful, we would lose a number of people we can't afford to lose. In fact, people of good, of good nature and good stature and good honor would show up, I'm sure. The problem is the other side would also have one heck of a turkey shoot on their hands. Unless I have my armor aircraft and air support there on hand, and I've got some but not enough for a toe-to-toe -to -toe fight, I don't plan on a toe-to-toe -to -toe fight. I want to, I want to bring that up, as, by the way, because that's where the problem is with this. We are going to fight as conventional forces. All of you will understand, and all of you have experienced, if you've been in the military, what a tank does and what an airplane does. What, a, what, a, what tactical aircraft can do. For that reason, we aren't going to fight on their terms. You dictate the battlefield. You dictate the time to fight. You decide where it is you're going to fight. And when you do fight, you destroy the enemy utterly. You cannot afford to let him leave the battlefield intact. And all I need to do is point out what happened at Waco. Those people found out the hard way and died. And what they did is they had the, they had the initiative and they won the, the, the original engagement they let them get away. I would have had the cameramen because that was all of the evidence. I would have had the individuals captured alive or dead, but I would have had them all. I would have run them across the plain of Texas until there wasn't anybody left to run down because they could not afford to do otherwise. And what happened is, as we know, 51 days later, they were butchered. And that's because, again, there was, there's a problem with the situation we're in now. None of us want to necessarily do this. There's a tremendous amount of frustration and hatred that is here right now because we know what their intentions are and we would like to strike even now. There are people that would like to think that we should not wait any longer. We have to balance that though. For every day that my voice can work and for every day that your voices work, we multiply our numbers a thousandfold, a hundredfold, tenfold. I can't, I can't even, it's, it's just hard to explain because of you to see it personally is amazing. It is, it is, it's a blessing. It's, it's fantastic. But what's happened is this. Linda's, Linda is in a situation that we're all in where, again, with the information we have, it is sound. We're talking like about fighting the IRS. That is a sound objective. But we are not going to be heard, and none of our papers will be, will be read or listened to. We are at that point in time where, where lines have been drawn all around us. Every one of you is in the same boat. Choose what it is you're going to sacrifice. You're going to give your kids away? You're going to hand your property over to them? You're going to give them your firearms? Are you going to hand over what you do have left in the way of, of retirement money or properties because they've decided that you need to be taxed more heavily and that they need to take everything from you that you do have? No. Well, that's the point. You've got a line drawn. And if you try to defend yourself in one direction, you're going to be pushed in another. And you're going to step over another line. If you have to defend in another direction to stop one action, you'll be pushed over another line because you are encircled now. The lines are not in front of you, they are around you. You have all been compartmentalized into in literally a box. Now you get to decide whether or not, like I said, free men or slave, you're going to stand. Um, I've got to be fair because you did ask a question. Oh, over in the corner there. Okay, you mentioned the uh, Church Universal trials that are listed in Claire Prophet. Right. Now other than that, do you know of any other uh, similar separatist type groups that would be likely targets for a Waco type deal? Well, the so okay. Okay, in the Carolinas, in North Carolina, they were very obscure, but there are several different militia units that have been in place for over probably two decades. They are known by most of the Patriot elements, and of course the other side has been able, I'm sure, to get uh, agent provocateurs into their circles and are identifying particular target threats. Now what they will do, they're not going to telegraph who, but they will, as the gentleman asked earlier, telegraph where, because they must stage prior to the activity. 
Now, the North, Car North Carolina is a target for a reason. If you take a look at the regional control of the, of the eastern seaboard, they have to create a physical blockade of the colonial states. Just north of the Carolinas, that's a logical demarcation line because of the terrain, the nature of the water, and where their military for forces are located. Now, it's personally, that's, that's something that's been, when, been considered for years with regard to continental defense. In this case, remember, you're dealing with a new world order, and most of what you're going to be dealing with won't be American anyway. In, the col in, in our old colonial states, uh, we have different nationalities dealing with each part of the country right now. And we've identified, for instance, in Michigan, a lot of Belgian troops. In, uh, in Florida, they have a lot of German troops right now. And they're being very, fairly well documented. They're also staying fairly mobile. The other sites in the different parts of the country, by the way, all vary, and some of them have been fabricated. Example, the gentleman that was uh, targeted in Michigan that I was talking about earlier, we didn't even know the man existed. It's n and what it is, he's very wealthy. He is not a, a common middle-class person. This man has millions of dollars. He bought a piece of real estate on Lake Michigan in a fairly depressed part of the state. You know, it's been economically depressed. He built what is, to my eyes, a mansion, a very nice house. He surrounded the property with fence. I've seen many wealthy people do that in Michigan, by the way, so he's not the first. And he is a, he had the worst, worst crime he committed, number one, he's a Christian. And number two, he has one of the largest, most comprehensive Bible collections in the United States, if not the world. And they specifically pointed that out in these articles, that he was a Christian. His crime was that he was a Christian, and that he had these Bibles, and that he had a bunker to put them in. Well, if I had several million dollars worth of Bibles, you can bet your bottom dollar that I'd have a bunker to put them in, too. Okay? Not only that, but myself included. But this story was propagated regionally. It was just for our benefit. It did not get any national news coverage, but it was an AP story. It was on the AP wire service. So it hit, for instance, the Lansing Journal, Grand Rapids newspaper, and the Detroit paper. And that's very, very rare because that's across the state. Normally, you just see things printed on the west side of the state and then something else printed on the eastern side of the state. And they're always separate. They never illuminate anybody to what's happening on either side. So this was very rare. And then in the Detroit area, they covered quite heavily two video stories about this man and his property. And that's rare by itself again because it had to do with Michigan. And hardly ever will you see any local news on your own state. You always hear about Bosnia, Herzegovina, but you'll never hear about what's happening in Michigan if you live in Michigan or the Carolinas, etc. Now, just a moment more. One other interesting thing that came out of this, the day after they did this, this uh, carpet bombing, of information, Janet Reno came to Detroit for special meetings with different political uh, entities in the Detroit proper, in the Detroit area proper. Okay, wait a minute, just a minute. Now these guys have been real patient on this side, and that's why they're not raising their hands. Who had a question here? Okay, please. SKS. There's a good question about that. Number one, I had a, I had a, and of course this will vary. There's different tight loads of ammunition that they've been bringing in. Some of it, or most of it, in fact, I probably all of it is to one degree or another safe. But there was a batch of ammunition that came in that was listed as Russian hunting ammo. It has a hollow point uh, on the end of it, right? It's an open open tip. I want anybody who's a machinist to look at it. I caught it right away. There is a gnarl on the tip, on the end of the cartridge, on the end of the bullet. And if you look down, you can see a steel core penetrator inside. What they've done is they've taken AP ammunition and run it through a machine and taken off the tip of a regular ball round bullet. Now this is technical, but anybody who's loading will understand the threat here because a jacketed bullet is poured from the back. If you cut the tip off, what you now have is a copper cylinder with a piece of lead in the middle of it. If there's any adhesion going down the barrel, the copper jacket will adhere to the barrel, the lead will be pushed through along with the AP round. Now you have a restriction in the barrel a thousandth or more thicker, actually twice that, two thousandths more than what is normally required. You will either hammer the action, you may bulge the barrel with the next round, at the very least you'll strip off the next copper jacket, the lead will be pushed through along with the AP penetrator, and you may have a catastrophic failure with the rifle if you're not careful. Now, on the other hand, with regard to that, we tested or had some of our people that said that they tested up to 1,200 rounds at a time because they they're, they're buying the ammunition in bulk. They had no problem with it. 
But remember that catastrophic failures, or when you sabotage, you want it to be random. Now, I'll balance that in this way. Number one, the SKS is cheap. I have a bunch of them. I don't even know how many, but let's put it this way. I'm grossly beyond the federal minimal requirements for an arsenal, okay? <laughs> I, if they do go through all these 4473s, I'm up a crick without a paddle, and I know they are, so I don't, that's why I don't worry. If they wanted to come after me in some way, they probably would. And, other, and I've bought many other arms. The SKS is an excellent rifle, maybe even over the AK-47, especially if you purchase the original military rifles, not the import rifles. The import rifles are good, but remember, if the Chinese make it for themselves, they make it well. If it's been used by them, then chances are it is a very well-constructed piece. Needless to say, it's not a Cadillac. Remember, you're buying a Volkswagen. But with a bayonet, I can get another rifle, even if the barrel doesn't work right. So it's pretty straightforward. And I have a real, I, I really, um, as I've demonstrated to a lot of people, it is an, a very accurate rifle for its class. It is listed not as a rifle, if you'll recall. It's listed as a carbine. And as a carbine, it fits that niche perfectly. As a utility rifle for garrison troops, like the, the situation in Waco, they should have had a larger number of simpler, cheaper weapons, I think, because they concentrated on the AK, which was higher priced. They would have had more weapons on hand, which have meant more weapons to use. You can't share a rifle, and you can't share a gas mask. You ever tried that? With a rifle, it's no fun. <laughs> Your turn, go ahead and shoot. With a gas mask, it's my turn to hold my breath for three minutes. Go ahead. You see? So you need gas masks and you need weapons. The SKS, the AK, I have no problem with, is a volume fire rifle. Most people ask me, what would you do with the AK? Number one, how much ammo can you carry? How much weight can you carry? You ever tried carrying your kit on your back? Don't go very far, do you? So you can't carry cases and cases of ammo. It's not like Hollywood where you... And you never reload the, the magazine, right? Unless it's a drum, and I have a healthy belief in drums. What you need to remember is you must sustain, you can't sustain rapid fire. What you need is accurate fire. Aim at the target, hit the target, and make sure it doesn't get up again. That's more important than anything else. However, for your AR automatic rifleman, you just call them that. They don't have to be. My finger's fast enough, you wouldn't know the difference, okay? But with the automatic rifleman, tick, 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 as an air defense gun with a drum, the AK is beautiful. A 75 or 100 round drum on an AK against helicopter threats is awfully nice because you don't have to worry about reloading. You can concentrate on the target. Now I also, myself, I was trained originally with the M14. I was not trained with the M16. I, was, I went into service with that later, about 1979. Originally I was trained with the 14 and I mostly used the AK-47 as a battlefield rifle. The M14 by far is still one of the best weapons available if you can afford it now. Six months ago, you could have afforded it. Now, as we all know, price has gone to the point where it's three and four times what it was. Now, any of the other standard martial arms, as long as they're standard for magazines, are acceptable. FNFAL, M16 Air 15 series rifles. Um, any of the old battle rifles like the M1 Garand. The Garand is still, in 30 out 6 a common rifle to find anywhere in the country. Can you find spare parts? Yes, I can. And more important than anything else is it's going to have to fit your budget. If anybody here is made out of money, offer some to everybody else so we can arm better. If not, this is how you got, this is how you got to work it out. You can buy 10 SKSs for the price of one AR-15 at least right now. In fact, more like, more like 20, because we all know where the price of the AR-15 went. Well, with 20 SKSs, I better be able to get a few AKs out of that. You know what I mean? Or a few, a few M16s or a few FALs, whatever it is the other side has when the time comes. They are serviceable enough, and they're more than, I, I'd be more than happy to carry any one of them into combat. I have. M1 carbine is excellent, especially for the ladies, for the younger people. Myself, I use it as a security arm, as a garrison rifle, and I've carried that myself also. Uh, the only thing I'll say about the carbine is because it's a smaller ammunition and really in a pistol caliber, it's a carbine again. Get hold of all the ammo you can and buy lots of mags. They're cheap. Carbine mags, I can carry, I can be standing here in front of you right now with a mag in each pocket and you never know it, plus the rifle with two magazines on the stock in, the, in a slip pouch with the old carrier pouches and a 30-round mag. The advantage to the carbine, I'm getting real technical here, it's not exciting for everybody, <laughs> but I'm going to do it. The carbine is a beautiful rifle because even if I stepped out of the shower bare ass naked to the wind, if the only thing I could do was grab a weapon, I can grab a rifle with two 15 round mags and a 30 round mag in the clip. If that isn't enough to get me out of something, I don't know what is. Now, it can also get me into a lot of trouble too. 
but it, chances are I'm trying to get out of something or get out of a situation. As a firepower weapon, again, anybody here who do doesn't think it's effective, stand over there in the back of the room and we'll take a shot from here. That's okay. Uh, yes? We've heard about it, yes. The question is, uh, President Clinton has signed into law an executive order declaring martial law. Well, it, we're, that was one of the other questions we had about traveling. We have, the, what I have heard so far, and what the information we have, and we will probably have a copy of it shortly, is that all of the executive orders with regard to FEMA and all other emergency powers have been consolidated into one executive order. However, unlike the normal circumstances where the executive order would then be left on the shelf unsigned until it is used, they have signed this executive order, which puts it into effect. This is a monumental step in obviously the wrong direction, but in order to implement much of what we're talking about, the FEMA and all of the emergency management executive orders must be in place, and they will be. It's just a matter of a stroke of a pen. Another thing, no executive order in the history of executive orders has ever been challenged by the House or the Senate, and they have always become law, period. Because you don't want to you don't want to piss off somebody else's president. You never know when yours is going to be up there and wants to sign one too. So they've all gone along with the game. Way in the back, any question? That's what I thought was June 3rd. Thank you. There was June 3rd. Okay, that's what we'd heard. Thank you very much. That it was signed June 3rd. Okay, it would have been approved. Okay, if it's in the Federal Register, it was approved and signed June 3rd. You have a copy? Okay, we do have a, if you can bring that up a little later, that would be fantastic. There is a copy here that people could look at. Yes, in the back, I'm going to be fair. Everybody's been real patient. That's good. My biggest perceived threat is helicopters being used to roadblocks and to carry the troops into the local area. Yep. The question is, please, what is the Okay. Well, well, okay. Technically, first of all, the question was how to deal with the air helicopter air threat, especially during the initial phases when they're coming in. To relate a story, because of course we would never shoot down black helicopters, but of course we might, and somebody may have. First of all, small arms fire concentration is important. I would recommend there are a couple of good manuals. If it flies, you can shoot it down. Uh, it was done by the military. It's a more recent air defense manual. You're dealing, first of all, the mental image you've got to understand of your, your aggressor is the pilots that are involved are looking at this as a police action. During the Waco attack, which is probably the best example of this, there were three helicopters involved in the initial, in the initial lightning raid. All of them were shot down. All of them with nothing more than standard 30 caliber rifle fire. Why? Well, you got a 30 uh, D-clip, a 30 caliber AK, uh, AP and a, an M1 rifle, it's good out to 1,000 yards and it drills three quarter of an inch of steel like butter. I'm telling you, I've done it like butter. Now with that in mind, 30 out 6, 308, 8 millimeter, 303, and of all the mother of cartridges, the Browning 50 caliber machine gun cartridge. And trust me, oof, you can find them. Uh, I would aim dead, I would aim, number one, depending on range, if it was very close, I'd dump it right into the crew compartment. If they're an intermediate range, aim center of mass and lead the target. The reason is that if you can accurately engage rotors, that'd be nice, but you have to assume that you're firing an, on an area target at distance. You want to get rounds into it to do damage. When it, with the Russian air, let's, let's do this properly so everybody will feel comfortable. The Russian helicopter threat being what it is, Okay, since obviously those wouldn't be our helicopters. These are Russian helicopters we're dealing with. Since the Russian helicopter threat is, is active, you will engage the targets at center of mass and try to dump as much, as much uh, munition into it as possible. Now, the way you have to do this if you're a ground infantry unit is you have to start working with control. You'll give a key or signal order that identifies to all of your people that they are to concentrate on air defense fire. All ground fires, all infantrymen, all auxiliary people, even non-combatants that can fire, use a weapon, will engage the air target, the air threat, first. 
Remember, once damaged or if they suspect hydraulic damage, rotor damage, or in any way, shape, or form fire, no pilot in his right mind wants to be in a flying barbecue at 400 yards. Okay? You're going to leave the AO and start to try and find a place to hit hard and, and get out because, you remember, you can't leap from a helicopter when it's crashing. The rotors catch up with you. Okay? As one of the sheriffs in our own state found out only a little while back, a sheriff's deputy jumped from the helicopter while it was crashing 20 feet off the ground. The only one that died was the guy who jumped out. And he was found in four pieces. So they're real dangerous to the crews on the ground, or the crews in the air and on the ground. But with regard to this at Waco, what I'll remind you of is that the helicopters were engaged after they, dev they actually, when they initially attacked, they did kill quite a few people with the helicopters. That did a lot of the lethal damage by all indications. And that's from the insiders, people who got out. However, once they finally realized the threat, because they weren't fully ready to really fight at all, they engaged the helicopters and did damage to all of them. The command and control helicopter left. It left the troops high and dry on the ground. You know, we're going to fight to the last drop of your blood. Goodbye. The two assault choppers that were infantry transporters both left, both of them damaged. One crashed two miles from the Waco church. The other one crashed four miles. In both cases, they probably came down in what sounds like an auto gyro crash hard. They didn't just break up. They were able to gain some control, and they went in hard into a, into a plowed field. A local farmer who was passing the field, and mind you, this is two miles from Waco, from the Waco attack. A farmer jumped out of his truck and went over to the helicopter to help them, thinking they were hurt. They grabbed him, threw him into a mud puddle, and tried to drown him, swearing at him and kicking him with their boots all the while. So they were just looking for anybody to strike out at, and they didn't care who it was. They were already beefed up and, and geeked up to go in and kill somebody, and they did kill somebody. Now, the helicopter threat was eliminated. Once the helicopter threat is peeled off from the infantry threat, any kind of air mobile assault, then all of a sudden you're on a toe-to-toe -to -toe footing with the enemy again. You look eyesight. You don't have to look like this. What, the, what this situation did is the same thing that will happen in most of your ground activities. Helicopters are used for hammer and anvil activities. Infantry move forward. Helicopters land and drop troops off ahead of the formation that's moving or being pushed. And then they, of course, take up the stragglers. With the helicopters destroyed, the helicopter threat is non-existent, and the aggressor loses a percentage of his combat force without it ever participating in the ground battle. That's very important. And the air threat can be dealt with. Yes? Um, I'd like to ask a question. Once again. Um, when I was growing up in Michigan, uh, also, mm -hmm. we used to have little um, stones that we put a uh, parachute on and throw them in the air. Yep. The Russian threat concept for uh, for uh, taking out any tank weapon or taking out tanks with a handheld any tank weapon use that principle with nothing more than something like a simple kite tail. Now, what be more would be a better a better technique, and you'll have to use your you'll have to improvise and use your own imagination. During World War II, our naval forces, our merchant marine, had a terrible threat with dive bombers and torpedo bombers coming across the ships. Of course, the solution that they came up with was to launch steel rods, not much bigger than this one right here. Attached to it were steel cables. Upon the approach during a run, the steel cables would be launched into the air. The aircraft would fly into the steel cables and Oops. Now that's devastating with a fixed wing aircraft, but a helicopter, well, the helicopter rotors are what keep it in the air. So needless to say, you can all imagine the, re the end result. It's a very simple and cheap result, cheap, uh, cheap response. The Navy built hundreds of thousands of these things, launched them or attached them to merchant marine ships in lieu of more guns, and they worked quite well against the torpedo threat. And they would work in any area where you might know, uh, where you might want to set up helicopter bait. In other words, if you want to lure something in and bring it down, which is another option. Of course, Russian threat helicopters only, in defense of the United States. Wait. Okay, thank you. First of all, and the question was, does the other side have an intelligence apparatus uh, capability, ATF, FBI? Oh, our side? Oh, yes. Well, yeah, we won't get into that too much, but yeah, we do. We have friendlies everywhere. We have good friends throughout the system, and they're people that have been reliable. Um, with regard to collections and operations or how to detect a problem in your, own, in your own midst, I will challenge you to do exactly what I've said every time when I've been with other patriots. First of all, we do not organize big. 
company strength units, platoon strength units are about as large as you want to go, and then make new units. They can have a mutual command, but they should all be separated so that no single unit can be decapitated with a pyramid attack on the command structure, on the people in charge. With your own units, with these people here, with these people here, or any of you right now who haven't organized, I want you to go and choose people that you feel safe with. I can't stress this enough, but I trust this right here more than anything else. Most people have a sixth sense, or what we call it is actually what is the subconscious is evaluating all the input and has come up with a solution already to what's going on, and usually you feel it right here. You know, the hackles on the back of your neck. When that happens, don't ignore it. Question why it is that some part of your mind is registering something that the, that the, conscience, the conscious has talked you out of. You need to be able to look in the eyes of a fellow patriot, the man that's going to be with you and you're going to trust your life with, and you get to decide whether or not you're going to stand with him. That's a personal experience and a personal thing that you have to decide amongst yourselves. If you don't feel good about it, be polite and recommend maybe that there be a change in how you, how you interact. But you need to collect a handful of men and women, families, six or seven you know, combat people involved with that, that group, maybe ten, and you need to organize privately. That is the best protection that you have. The Founding Fathers organized that way in this country for a reason. I'll remind you something, because people complained about me using Mark from Michigan. Remember all the ridicule we got over that? Some people are familiar with it. There was all kinds of, well, why doesn't he use his last name? Anybody who knew me knew my last name. The Founding Fathers of the United States never used their names in any of their documents that they wrote, and many of them are, not, are still not fully identified. They used, for instance, Shakespearean names out of Anthony and Cleopatra and also out of Caesar because they knew full well what the ambition of the crown was if they could find out who wrote the documents that were being used. And so even George Washington or Patrick Henry and all of the others had, had different names that were, were applied to their works. Sometimes they weren't even given credit even years later for what they'd actually written. They didn't care. The idea was is not to profit or for ego or to make money. The idea is to broadcast and get out information. See? The difference is that's why those things are said we reproduce. There's no protection. There's no nothing on them. We just made good copies so that you'd have real good copies to copy from. And the information is out there so that you can challenge it. People can argue it. People have argued on and off and have wasted a lot of some time, I won't say a lot of time, trying to debate this. I wanted to spark the people. And I know I have because there's some people right here that are sparked. Okay? But what's happened is you had to ask the question, well, wait a minute, this is right, this is right. Well, I don't know about this, but I can see things right here from my own experience. And then all you need to do is wait, and your enemy has announced the rest. There's not a single thing that if you look at American peril is not uh, future history past now, literally. And in, unfortunately, I should say, because the sad part is I'd hope to hold them back longer. We are fighting a rear guard action. That's really all we're doing. Every patriot you've seen that's been, trying, been making all the noise that they have, my logic is this. The longer that we can hold them back with words is the greater the amount of time that you'll be able to collect bullets and bayonets because there's still going to come a time where you're going to use them. I can only hold them for so long. We've been fighting a holding action for years. We've dug trenches. We've expended wealth. We've spent our lives and our time. We gave you everything we could. Now it's your turn. Like I said, all day today, it's your turn. They're going to get us one way or another put out of the picture. One way or another, trust me, I plan on living through this, guys. I don't have a suicide, uh, suicide wish. I want to live to see the end of all this so that I can be there for the trials, so that I can see the elections, and so I can participate in a, a true American government when we're done, so we can all be free. <laughs> and trust me, it's hard. Now, wait a minute, I'm going to be fair now. Uh, I'll finish. I know you hit a few, a little more. Right there, sir. Yeah. No, no, you're, yeah, you're good. It's okay. Or, well, response. We won't be reaction. We don't want a knee jerk, but response, yes. Oh, I agree. This is part of our problem, and it is a, the, the difficulty is this, and, and I will, I gotta remind you something. I've looked into a lot of good guardsmen's eyes, so we can't just shoot at the, I mean, we'd never shoot, just shoot at the guard. The, the aggressor, when we identify him on the ground, and especially, people ask me about this, I came in in a different uniform. Most people said, I thought that was a bad uniform. 
Well, it is unless you want to get close. And then it's the right uniform, okay? Well, there is going to come a time when we can identify the threat easily enough, and, and this has been asked by many good people just in the last two days. I've had a lot of conversations on this. It's a hard decision to make, but it will be obvious when the time comes that we will have to go on the offensive. That offensive's mission for the people who, are, who participate in it will be, again, to buy yet more time. And it is still the best way to fight because the, I, like I said, I can't face tanks, and I don't expect any of you to, and I don't want to hear about any silly actions with people charging with bayonets against armor, okay? Don't do it. There's no need to. Back off, walk away, pick your time, and come back in when they're sitting on the pot or when they're trying to mix up lunch or when they're in the wrong place at the right time, and then the tank's yours. Okay, then you can go down the road in a 52-ton Cadillac and have fun, okay? But in the meantime, that's the type of offensive action that will be needed. Now, many units will be coming to us complete. See, that's one of the other problems. I will say this, the way that you will identify them is by that right there. Because they will bear the American flag, and they will also have been told already, and in fact, our aircraft will be marked. So that's one of the ways somebody said, well, what do you know if they're a friendly helicopter? Well, initially, no helicopter's friendly, trust me. We, unless you see it with a big American flag painted on its belly, and it may be hand-painted, but you'll know it's one of ours, that'll be the difference between the enemy and us. We do not skulk, we do not hide, we do not cower at the fact that we are patriots. The other side is based upon terror and, and, and sedition. We're based upon truth and honor, and so we'll be easily identified as far as being threat or non-threat. Well, but in most cases they can't afford to because confusion of targets is a dangerous thing and they'll already be committed to the UN. By the time this, in fact, you're seeing this right now, we're, we're in the middle of, if the, with the executive order that we just talked about, that actually is an act of war against the people right now. We don't know. I think what it is, like, well, let me put it this way. I can't say that. Let's, let's, let's go through a logical step here. Did he not just come back from the Bilderberger meeting in Europe? If he just came back from the Bilderberg meeting, as I said, he's received his marching orders. These were part of the marching orders that have been given. Oh, thank you. He's accelerating because every day that you and I have is another day we talk to people, and we're very dangerous. This tongue wags everywhere. Okay, very good. National Defense Industrial Resources Preparedness Executive Order. By the authority vested in me as president of the Constitution and the laws of the United States of America, including the Defense Production Act of 1950, as amended, 64 statute 798-50, USC, appropriated 2061, uh, et sequestered, and section 301 of Title III, United States Code, and as Commander-in-Chief of the United Armed Forces of the United States, it is hereby ordered as follows. Purpose, policy, and implementation is included priorities and allocations, and this includes the implementation the director of PEMA shall attempt to resolve issues or disagreements on priorities or allocation between federal departments or agencies in a time frame consistent with the urgency of the issue at hand, and if not resolved, such issues will be referred to the assistant to the president for national security affairs for final determination. The director of the International Monetary Fund becomes the director and coordinator of all activities. That's an international director. In other words, what they're doing is saying clearly and publicly what they've been saying privately for the last two decades. So there's more to this. I will, in fact, can I, I'm, I'm going to give it back. I'm not going to keep it. <laughs> Again? Thank you. What this is, what, what this will do, in fact, uh, if you'll recall, under, under the FEMA Act, um, U.S. citizens can be uh, sequestered into labor forces. Women, oh, it is in here too? Okay, then they've, what they've done is made it overt again. Men and women can be separated from their children. The children can be put into separate labor forces. The men can be put into separate labor camps. And the women can be put into separate labor forces and camps also. So it is just a matter of time before, of course, this is initiated. Linda Thompson has some of the information. Did you get this from her system? Okay, very good. This came from Linda Thompson's um, uh, computer net, and I'm sure that we can probably, well, of course, it can be duplicated now, too, or copied. Uh, yeah, gentleman right behind the other blue gentleman. They're spread out. Yep. Same format, same, same way. 
Right. First of all, they won't be using the ATF uh, assault transports, you know, cattle cars, which were appropriate. Um, instead, they're going to probably use a series of, again, air mobile operations, hammer and anvil. They'll infiltrate and exfiltrate out with their ground troops. They'll infiltrate within probably the first 20 or 15 hours. The attack will come somewhere between 3.30 and 6 o'clock in the morning. It will typically involve probably a platoon per each site. The, the assault element will be 10 to probably 12 men. Uh, again, typical PASGAT armor with reinforced threat level 3A armor for all frontal portions. My personal response to an assault team, especially an entrance team, is flame weapons. I want them dancing in the front yard with the plastic burning to their skin. Okay, And the way to do that is alcohol is your friend. If you don't want to have alcohol sitting around, which is not really all that combustible when sitting in the room, put a plastic, uh, put, take a fight. It's real simple here. This is a real stupid way to do it, but it works. Again, kiss, keep it simple, stupid. A uh, five-gallon pail full of, of uh, high-proof alcohol, preferably laboratory grade. All you do is just to kick it over if all else fails near the entrance, or if preferably I just give them a bath. Anybody touches it off. They touch something off, you touch something off on the way around, it all goes. Preferably a nice 12 gauge flare or an improvised munition will set it off. When it burns, it's hard to see. So they won't even know right away that they're burning. Once they do start burning, have you ever tried shooting somebody when you're doing this? It doesn't work. The other option is the poor man's nuclear device, chemical weapons. Ammonia by itself is a very desirable chemical attack weapon. You don't even have to atomize it. Anybody in this room right now knows if we bust open a gallon, lay it in the middle of the floor here, I'd say I'd give us less than 20 seconds to decide we want to leave. Okay? So what you do is a nice high test ammonia product can be used near the entrance. And again, it can be used in an atomizer form. You can use a dump bucket from above. It need only be a spill bucket with something that'll, that's, that, that covers the lid. So of course, you don't have to worry about vapors. Um, glass is nice, yeah. The other option, if you want to use an enhancer and, and come up with our friend Phosgene, is ammonia and Clorox. One gallon mix each, boom, splash. Again, <coughs> if they're doing that, they're not doing this. And of course, I wouldn't shoot the ones that are burning. I'd let them burn. That's right. The ones that are burning are upsetting the ones that aren't. <laughs> Isn't that right? World Order, which we're in the process. We started trying to finish it up as quick as we can. We may not get it out in time even. If it's done, it'll have a lot of neat little tips in it for cooking. <laughs> in the South Pacific, they call people long pig. Remember that. Okay. Many manuals for, that's right. Also, thank you very much. In our area, they've been really been attacking gun shows, of course, and you've heard that all over the country, too. Any literature that you can acquire should be acquired now. Now. Not two weeks down the road, not four weeks down the road. Anything on how to make or assemble or do anything, do it and then duplicate. I don't care about copyrights. When the time comes, they won't make any difference. Duplicate it and send it to the wind. Spread it everywhere. Give it to everybody and anybody that's in the system. The reason I say this, if you have one copy, you need only destroy one site. That's right, yes. Copy it on the floppy. Oh, yes, yeah, that's right, yes, on the floppy disk, and you can, that's right, a lot, of, yeah. CDs, uh, any, kind of, any type of uh, computer database with floppy disks or whatever, you can hand it to somebody, they'll crank out 15 million and they're everywhere. And you won't have to worry about it. They're hidden in a hundred different places and can never be found. He was real polite. He's, gonna, he's been waiting. Go ahead. Yes. I thank you. Lumberyard. One of the tricks, though they're antique, that works quite well, are old phonograph needles. Down here, you can find them. Go to the old. You got all kinds of great flea markets. Those are case-hardened chrome steel needles. We have found, uh, strangely enough, and I don't know, of course, if real re the research was, was done by somebody, that these will penetrate almost every type of, of conventional body armor known to man. So it's rather desirable to have you the phonograph needle. You simply center the bullet, uh, drill it, and then impress the uh, phonograph needle, and then putty it over a little bit on top. Plumber's putty works fine. Hydraulically, you can do, uh, uh, we did a lot of research back in the 70s with this anyway for when the reloading was a problem then. 
uh, hydraulic or hydrostatic rounds. You need to do nothing more, not even mercury. Simply use uh, latex um, caulk. Make up a hollow point out of lead, use latex caulk. You have the same effect as a shape charge when it hits. It forces the thing through and creates lubrication, and as it collapses on itself, the lead follows the latex through the armor, and the rest is history. Carbide drill bits. Old carbide drill bits are thrown away constantly and are very desirable. That's another option. Yes? Yep, smaller. Any kind of steel. Oh, by the way, I noticed something when we were visiting your highways. You may have noticed, oh, this is, we're going to look at Mark and go, what the heck is he talking about? I've noticed in all of your uh, rest, restroom areas along all the highways that they've been doing a lot of renovations, haven't they? Have you noticed that they've redone all the toilet stalls in all those bathrooms? Everybody's going, huh? Have you noticed that it's plastic? Do you know what kind of plastic that is? Do you know how much those, those toilet stalls cost? The gray, and the, they're, they're gray, and the other ones are black with little model covers on the outside of them. Well, those doors are 5 eighths or 3 quarter inch laminate Kevlar. That is a solid block of Kevlar plastic sitting there in that bathroom stall. If you ever get shot at, head for the toilet. Okay? It is the safest place in that truck stop or rest area to go. They look like battleship gray. You'll find when you scratch them, they're made out of plastic. People have already been scratching them. The reason they were purchased is because they have color, full depth, and if you have to repair them, you just bring a sander in with a fine grit and sand off the graffiti. The color's already there. But the neat thing is, so is the Kevlar. Now, I don't know who did this, but in testing these, we found that they will stop 30 out 6 butt cold flat. It would be awfully nice to have that in the back of my truck or my car going down the road. It might be nice to have under the windows at your house, too. Be a lot of rest areas without doors now. I know that. I shouldn't, <laughs> shouldn't have said this, but it's true. But there might come a time when those rest areas won't need to be used all the time, and it'd be desirable to recover that stuff if there's been damage, of course. Way in the back. Yes. numbers will become obvious very quickly, but there, excuse me, they would hope probably to act within a 48-hour 48, uh, 48 period, 72 max, probably, of course, starting on, the, on the, the initial phase of a weekend, Friday. The reason for that is that in many cases, most people wouldn't catch on to the fact that if you've been arrested, a lot of people would assume, oh, he was picked up for traffic violations or something. I don't know, but he just, the police were there. Uh, they'll go get him Monday. Well, you got three days to play with somebody because most people don't realize that uh, you're going to a camp and not to the local jail. That's the first technique that's been used for a long time and, and is usually used when law enforcement wants to harass you, even if they don't have a solid case. Pick you up on a Friday, a magistrate's not going to see you all weekend. You're going to spend two days in jail even if you're innocent. Okay? Now, the point being here, though, that they'd still probably start at the end of the week simply because, again, lack of communications, people taking advantage of the holiday period, you know, weekend is a holiday period, guys. People are away from home. They'll figure that uh, the communication nets are down and your defenses are down. Now, personally, I think all the time because it's, they're going to pick their day. But, as I said, the window of opportunity for most of it is the pre-dawn hours because it, it is, it's, it's their assumption that even if you're prepared, you are going to decide to let your guard down if something doesn't happen immediately. Let me give you the most recent example of that, Red Beckman. Okay, is anybody familiar with the Red Beckman situation? Now, we warned him. I, we actually sent couriers I, through with different messages. We explained to them what we expected. They had 500 patriots show up for several days. The government backed down completely. Well, a few days later, they got another little bit of a warning, and uh, several hundred pa people showed up and rotated out of the area for a few days. 
Unfortunately, what the other side did is they waited two weeks. Two weeks after the last initial uh, security effort was made, rather than taking these 500 people and spreading them out over weeks and weeks so you'd have somebody there all the time, since it didn't happen right away, they, everybody went home figuring he's safe, everything's fine. Two weeks after the last person left, they came at 6 in the morning. Red Beckman apparently came out of his, out of his farmhouse, walked to the back to do his chores, a couple of platoons of black-clad uh, ATF, ATF, FBI, DEA, and whoever were there. Apparently it was multi-jurisdictional. They grabbed him. They took everybody off the property. The next day they brought a bulldozer in and flattened the place. So nobody's going to collect on a house, guys. Now this is typical, again, because they're very, they're, they, they rely upon the fact that we don't think about them as doing their job full time. They do it for a living. You have to start thinking that way yourself. Your defense is a full time, uh, you know, everyday experience. There are certain times when they feel you will be at your weakest point. Part of this is logic is, is, is through research, REM sleep. What block do you usually experience REM sleep? The average individual goes to bed between 9 and 11 at night. First, you identify and observe your target. Identify what times he goes to sleep. Once you know approximately when the lights go out in the house, click. You know that within so many hours, REM sleep takes effect. Once you're into REM sleep, it's very difficult, short of a 2 by 4 or a cold glass of water, to get somebody up out of it. And of course, when they do respond, yeah, uh, what was that? Who's happening? Who's there? They count on this. They've done research. That's what all that research is being collected for in all these universities for the benefit of the government, not for you. They pay for it. They get it first. So they've already worked out the basics. Now, that doesn't mean they won't try other events. Most common is people make the mistake of going to the, to the mailbox, first of all, uh, by themselves. If they're, if they're in a rural area, they're in a situation where they decide to walk down to the mailbox. Nice idea. But if you think you're in a threat environment, I'd be going down with a car, and of course, I would be armed. And I might even have a friend with me who is cocked, locked, and ready to use. That's simply policy. We never leave anywhere without somebody, always. I don't let anybody go anywhere without somebody, always nowadays. And that's just common practice. If you get into the practice, it becomes common trait. It does not become a special event. It becomes part of everyday life. Then it's nothing special, nothing exotic for you to start thinking, rather than walking along with blinders most of the time. Way in the back. She's real urgent. <laughs> Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Just no further. That's okay. Oh, that works right into this here because I've dropped it twice. This is a, a, a sample of one of the larger chips. It is probably the size of the one they were also using on the horses, though it could be used on people. There is a smaller version. I want to pass this around. You gotta make sure we get it back. Somebody else owns this, not me, please. Okay, here we go. We'll be fair. Okay. Now, the chip technology has been in place for a number of years, and it was available first to the military for identifying combatants, military personnel, might be dropped behind enemy lines, and to identify and perhaps control them. There are discussions and arguments about using them to create uh, super soldiers by being able to affect the nervous system in different ways. Uh, case in point about what the chips for in the Mark of the Beast. Already, when the Emperor showed you, Bill Clinton showed you the card. Remember, he did this in the House of Representatives in the Senate joint session. This is the card you're all going to get. And if you don't take it, well, guess what? You don't eat. And you don't get medical treatment. They also said this, that as quickly as they came up with it, we were going to have health care card abuse. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Create the problem, demonstrate the problem, come up with a solution people would not have accepted otherwise. First of all, we don't need the national ID card. Since we're traveling off into this brave, warm, fuzzy new world order, and all the borders are going to be down, why do we need any ID card at all? Aren't we all going to be one big happy family of people? Aren't we all just going to be able to travel from, oh, that's right, we won't be able to, will we? Well, you know, but the idea was nice. In reality, what it is, it's word speak, like Orwell. What they want is for the card to have, a, for people to abuse the card, and that's going to happen, because I'm not going to take the card. None of my family is. Everybody I associate with is not going to take the card also. We also know we want to have a job. Well, what's going to happen is this. We might have a card that somebody else had at one time, and I can see this gentleman, if he shaved his beard and cut his hair a little shorter, could look enough like me. Our glasses are the same. I could darken his hair and almost get him, him pass. Probably a quarter of the people here are close enough that we could walk in with the other guy's ID. Well, that's why they said, even in the same session, that we were going to have to have 
the medical police. You know, the doctor SWAT teams. They're going to bust into the operating room, rip that artery out, rip out those hearts, and throw them back because you don't deserve them, you know? Bits and pieces. Well, you all can almost picture that, but in a different vein. Oops, pardon the pun. <laughs> the, um, the problem here is that, uh, of course, we would have these abuses, and then they would have to search out the perpetrators and destroy them. How would they punish us if we did commit a medical crime because we needed treatment? Well, the best thing to do is put us into a prison camp or jail and not treat us. That's a death sentence without ever having to charge anybody. If you're going in because you needed cardiopulmonary surgery and they say it's going to take two to three years to get you through the criminal system just for trial, do you think you're going to live to see the end of the trial? And if you do live to see the end of the trial, you're not qualified for any of the surgery anyway, so you're not going to be in jail long either, are you? So what sense does that make? Well, first of all, it creates another police force. Remember, they're trying to create as many law enforcement agencies as they can. Second, the card abuse then puts or sets up the, uh, the scenario, which was already discussed in PL 100-690 with the national ID card system. There were four programs proposed, four, count them, four. Cost $127 million. Part of the program was covered on C-SPAN in the House Joint Session with the committees that were discussing this very subject two years ago, two plus years ago. Now in it, they explained that the chip was an option, but they didn't think people would accept it, so they had to work through a series of steps. The step was first off for the card, the next is to go to the chip. That chip is old technology that's being passed around. That is actually 1978 through 1983 technology that is sound and works. The new chips are smaller still. They say that, the, in fact, with, a, with a, a series of tapes, there are two of them. It's called the Mark of the Beast 1 and the Mark of the Beast 2. If you can find them, get them. They were not made by anybody. You know what they did? They took state-of-the-art business advertising from electronics companies that are doing all the research on these chips, and that's all that the tape is. So you don't get to hear somebody like me talking the only people talking are the sales representatives showing how the technology works and how it will be used. Yep. This is saying AT&T was testing in North Carolina. Now the chip, again, before we ever get the card, I mean, before I get to the chip, I'm not taking that. I'm not taking the card. We are going to be enemies of the state one way or another. As I said before, while I'm defending here, I get pushed over the line here. It's going to happen one way or another. I uh, can't accept it. Now, uh, well, some of the options, what do you do to prepare for that, for instance? And this gets into what everybody else asked. Medical support items are crucial. Agriculture does not only include food production, but also drug production. And we're not talking uh, anything that's illegal. But herbology is very important right now because most, and I, I can tell you this for a fact, the people I'm talking about work for Warner Lambert and some of the other companies that research this. Most of the drugs that you take are nothing more than the simplest of weeds and chemicals put together in the simplest possible way because they want to make maximum profit. Probably the best example of this is chlorets. Anybody ever take chlorets before as just a breath freshener? You know what it is? The green is made from grass, literally, grass. It requires some corn syrup and they also use a little bit of spearmint. Total cost per pack is less than half a cent, including the paper wrapping. For the whole pack, how much do you pay for a pack? Ah, and the candy coating was developed to be used in medication. It was a byproduct to sell it as chlorets as a candy for you to eat to freshen your breath. That's how all the drug system is. That's why they're called the Seven Sisters, the, the drug cartel of the Seven Sisters, like they were the Seven Sisters of Oil. There's the Seven Sisters of the drug industry. And they're all, the top nine chemical and drug companies are owned by who? Rockefeller. <laughs> Whoops. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, this one can be, in, okay, now we have a, okay, we don't have it here. Up at Michi in Michigan, we do have a copy. They sent us, well, they sent one of our people three samples of the chip and the injector unit to install the chip. It's the smaller one than the one that's here. This one is a larger unit. This one would work with people, by the way. It'd be very easy. This could be... Yes, okay, uh, uh, talking about the vaccination problem. It is possible with the latest of chips that they could incorporate in the vaccination program, but I don't think they're going to bother to conceal it. I think that instead, that will be the way to get people in, and then they're just going to explain to them why they're there. Well, you know, 
if you want any further treatment considering these terrible plagues we're having and the fact that people are having a problem getting food if you want to eat you'll take this and you will eat and if you don't go over there to the other door category b it works that simply uh yes Sorry. How do you see the Patriots, once all this happens, communications are virtually going to be shut down. How do you see one group of 